Thank you, everybody, for coming to the summer March meeting of the People Watershed Committee. Kind of nice to not see a lot of jackets on, but very scary. We will start as we always do, going around the room. Um, also, go this way this time. My name is Pedro Marquez, I'm the Executive Director of the Watershed Committee. I'm Tara Lynch, I'm the Associate Director of the Watershed Committee. I'm the Board of Restoration Programs Manager. Caitlin Warren, BNRC. Caitlin Malloy, SWP. I'm Ryan Kreider, and I'm the Director of the Native Fish Biologist. Mark Rafty, Lord Benwell, Rancher, and on the Benwell Watershed. I'm Ariane, and I'm on the Western Adventure. Eight meters to the upper big orange. Diverting and Eastern Services. Jamming <laughs> I'm a the fire farmer with the big old room. Tom Bowler, from you. Bowler, from you. Craig Cohen, local resident, Wise River. Charlie Iver, resident, Wise River. And Bay, resident, Wise River. Development business owner in Colorado, Pine Mountain County. Duncan Adams, Montana Standard. Area Zephyr, Sides and Dawn. Plus a virtual with the Major Conservancy. Tax Fuller, PNC. Carol, and the Dawn. Sean Lewis, and RCI is still on. All right. Awesome. Jay, then you're ready. Okay, we'll start with our official snowman report. Yeah. All right, so I'm Caitlin Boring. I work for Montana DNRC. I'm a hydrologist in the Upper Big Bowl. <laughs> I usually give a precip report every month. I just started putting this up on our on my presentation every month so that everybody knows where our stream gauge sites are. Blue is real-time sites, red is seasonal sites, and you can access it at this website. So if you ever wanna know what's going on with Big Bowl, it's right there, and it'll be in this map format. I also wanted to talk about our stream gauge program. We got a bunch of money from the legislature to add 100 new stream gauges to Montana's system. And this is a map of everything that we're going to be doing either in the future or in next year. I think their goal this year is to increase our stream gauges by 30 of them. And the ones planned are the, are the stars, the yellow stars. The, the green triangles are existing gauges that we have right now. And then the red is proposed future stream gauge sites, either 2025, 2026, or 2027. Uh, Something cool that's going to happen is we're getting three new gauges in the Big Bowl area. The first one is going in on the North Fork of the Big Bowl River below the battlefield. We also got approved to have a real time site on Deep Creek. And then the next one's going to be on Wise River above Pettengill. Those two, I think, are going to be put in in 2026, but the battlefield is going to be put in this year. So that's cool to have something on the North Fork.
the USGS has turned on a few of their the lower stream gauges. This is out down by Maiden Rock. It is on, but I still feel like there is ice effects going on because you can see these big oscillations in the discharge every day, but it is open enough to channel to be able to get a discharge. Yeah. Melrose is also on and their um, temperature gauge is also running. So I think that it's a little bit warmer. It looks like a couple of peaks at 46 degrees since March 14th. So that's kind of crazy. Glenn is on and it's got some oscillations in temperature that are going up past 45 degrees. Snow water equivalent in the big hole is 69% of median values. It was at 72%, but I think those warmer temperatures over the last couple of days have dropped it down a couple of percentages. This is the hips on the sweep. So basically where the snowpack is elevation wise and what you can see is most of the snowpack is between 6,000 and I don't know, 85 to 9,000 feet. Everything's below average right now, as we all know. Some of the snow tail sites that we got, Dark Horse Lake is at 70% of the NRCS median right now, Slap and Parker Lake 62%, Calvert Creek, which is that low elevation, is at 56% of normal. Precipitation is 72% of median values right now. Climate outlook, we're uh, in, still in El Nino, but we're going to be transitioning to ENSO neutral with an 83% chance between April and June, and then a 62% chance of going into La Nina by June or August. Hopefully that means that it's going to dump precipitation between those two switches. A 8 to 14 day temperature and precip, we're going to be below average and above average below average temperatures and above average precipitation. Seasonal hasn't changed since February. Still, they're predicting higher than average temperatures and equal chances to below average precipitation. Hopefully that changes because I've been watching it and it, it's continuing to trend towards more precipitation. This is the drought monitor. It was updated on March 12th. This is kind of more in depth than I usually show, but I wanted to just, it has like start current drought conditions and then last week and then at the start of the water year. So it's kind of super interesting. Most notably, we've got this like big red spot that have developed and that's extreme drought. This is all accessed at um, drought.co if you want more in depth. <laughs> This is the drought monitor change. So in classes, so it's either like drought persisting or um, decreasing. And it, I think it's kind of interesting because it's sh showing that we're actually like improving a little bit down here in the like the western side and the southwest side. Um, gray is no change in um, drought class. So this is a schematic of departure from normal temperatures ranging between February 9th and March 9th of this year. Darker colors are, are colder or a further distance colder than normal temperature and warmer colors are warmer than normal temperatures. So it looks like we're doing pretty, like we're pretty on par with normal temperature changes. Here's just another schematic of county precipitation rates. The dark blue is record precipitation, and then as you go into warmer colors, that's that's record dry. That's all I got. <laughs> you guys got any questions for me? Okay, thank you. Thanks to the trial committee, we had the. We got word about these stream gauges and this funding kind of the very last minute, right before our drought committee meeting, and folks brainstormed. 
places that made sense for these gauges. From my understanding, the North Fork of the Big Hole River has to do with CSKT compact, right? And that's why they're putting it right at the battlefield. Um, it's the proposal that's you know, being negotiated. And then Deep Creek, I think, has always been a pet project, always been a site that the NRC's had, maybe. Yeah, easier for you, right? Yeah. One less site to go monitor. So we've always had, we've been gauging Deep Creek for, for a while, but now it'll be automatic when that comes online. And then Pettengill, um, the Wise River, you know, we've got a site at the downstream end of Wise River and have been doing a lot of work in that drainage. I did part of what I did, it's not on here, but I've been recently working on, you know, at the top 10 level, looking at all our sub drainages and the Wise River really pops out for a lot of reasons. One of them being it's the, the least amount of water rights for the size of the watershed. So potentially one of these places that we can make a substantial difference in what that main tributary can contribute to the whole river. The Deep Creek and Wide River are kind of pretty critical arteries for cold water and fisheries habitat, etc. And you know, we've been knocking Deep Creek out of the park for the last 12 years or so as far as restoration and everything possible. So Wise River is a big focus for us. That's just a little background on why those gauges came out. We toyed around with a couple other ideas. If anyone has any ideas on places where we could have a real time gauge, always bring it to us and we you know, can put it in the mix for future conversations. Um, <clears throat> okay, I don't have in here also just a couple notes on two uh, of our. Partnership agreements that we've been working hard on. Um, first, with the Forest Service uh, at Elkhorn, that project is just now really moving forward into light speed. The forest seems to find big piles of money every time we ask them. We're at we're doing a, an ECA, which is an environmental valuation cost analysis. It's the super fun version of an environmental assessment where you have to talk about the different things you could do on a site and why you chose to do the thing that you're doing. That document's in draft and we have money already secured for a 30% design. Long story short, it's 50,000 cubic yards of contaminated soil still that need to be pulled out of that location. The Forest Service has closed the Elkhorn until we get this remedy done, probably not to a point to where the funding works out. The school that goes down is still open, so you can still go access the site. You just can't cross the bridge and go into where the orange water and the soil is until we get it out of there. But we're got a draft agreement going now. They also found structural damage to the mill. No one should ever be on that structure. <laughs> and you know, people have made music videos like picking that third round, and that scared the Forest Service quite a bit. And they issued a closure order for good reason. We're getting money to retrofit the columns on that structure so that it doesn't fall. So that's a big effort. That has to all get done before you get equipment in there to dig out the dirty dirt. So they're putting about $550,000 into our existing partnership agreement to get all this work accomplished in like the next year. And then design comes in, gets finished, and then they're looking for another probably two and a half to four million dollars to get the remedy actually completed, starting in 26. Um, and it's a beautiful thing, these partnership agreements, because the feds need to get their money obligated and they like working through us because we can move a lot faster than them. So we're, we're kind of sitting in a great spot to just get these important projects done. Similarly, with the BLM, with our existing agreement that Ben's working on, the Eastern Pioneers, they also happen to find a pile of six figures of money that they're going to pour into our existing agreement. And we're looking at, it's going to expand this program to close, with Forest Service money to close to a thousand acres, I think, of, of conifer encroachment for uplands in right there, and it will be due over the next couple of years. Okay. That's just the, the, the public dollars and grants. I wanted to bring up these two events that are coming up, um, Conifer Expansion Summit that uh, the Southwest Montana Sagebrush 
partnership is putting together on March 27th from one to five. That's at UN Western, I think. Right. And then while in Montana, the very next day, um, hosting a conversation with Hillary Hutchinson about watershed challenges. And I believe Wade Fellon is going to be there as well, co presenting with her. So that'll be two events that if you're all over, around Dylan, please go to. Um, and then the third one, which is really exciting for me in the smelter work that we've been doing, I was told about this gentleman, Jack Lozinski, who's a retired Forest Service employee who just has a passion for that area. And he has, he was mapping the old log flow from that Mount Hayden area from the mining days. And he had it all in UTMs and I, at one point, like, it's a way to do mapping. And at one point I spent like half a day trying to re-digitize what he was doing, but thankfully now he's got a book coming out. It's actually out. It tells the story of that, the whole flume construction and logging is fascinating. We're now, you know, we've been cleaning up the mess from that flume for 12 years now, but it's also a feat of engineering and ingenuity that, that there's still parts of it still around. So that book is out and you can get it. Second edition books in view, Thrifty Drug in Anaconda, and Jack and I are supposed to hook up, and I'm supposed to bring some copies here. So we're having some. Anyway, for history people, is that? That's a good question. Well, I think they're like $28. 28 something like that. Anyway, great little piece of big old history that's been published. I'll go run through really quickly. We're just <laughs> Running through uh, Broad Reach Fund is a, a foundation out that was really interested in the beaver related work that we've been involved with. And uh, we found out that we secured about 20 grand from them for a variety of beaver related, both capacity and projects. Um, we requested some money to the High Stakes Foundation. We've been with them for the last two years. Uh, Cinnabar, again, we requested. We requested another amount. This is all kind of capacity money, just keep the wheels turning for us. Um, and then I'll bring up a couple issues that came, that have come up recently, uh, that hit my desk. Um, cloud seeding, a feasibility study has been approved for the big hole. There was some money that got passed in the last legislature for looking at this technology for Montana. And there were a couple of options of places that they could go. Uh, to do this feasibility and they end up landing here with us in the big hole. That's the DNRC is leading that effort with some contractors, just looking at sort of where you would possibly do a very initial stage. But we got the nod and part of my understanding why it's coming here is this group. And, and the fact that we have a place we come together regularly, it's a great place to come and talk about ideas and get them implemented. So. Kudos to, to all of you who have board for what you've been holding together all these years. We are working on an MOU with the Gray Lane Partners Program. And you know, we, we have an existing MOU with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and that's more of a funding agreement to sort of allow us to act as a partner with Gray Lane projects to get money to the ground faster. This MOU is it's more symbolic than anything. It's just saying that we're a partner in this broader collaboration of, of great investigation. It's part of that I just had a great conversation with Maddie and about this, and we're going to do this. So I just wanted to let you guys know that's coming. And I think it just, you know, just adds us to the list of partners that are helping out in any way we can. And I was thankful to the Grayling group to invite me into their meeting this spring, early spring. Oh, it's still winter. This is throwing me off. It was winter and we talked about what they're up to for the upper big hole. And that was the first time we've been invited to kind of sit at the table and see how we can work together. So that was awesome. More things to come. We had a similar, I like to joke, we had a similar meeting with the Forest Service up in Wisdom and it's just sort of helping us turn the black box gray. So like we know a little bit about what's going on. So it's like less of a mystery. And that's part of, I think, just partnership development. It's all good. It's slow. But it's good. Black box and gray. Then apparently, and eventually it becomes transparent. We're just rocking and rolling. 
The reason I will not be at either of these two is they're the exact days of the Montana Fever Working Group meeting. I've been sort of leading kind of the regulatory part of that group for years, um, so I have to be there for that one. Ben's got his hands tied up with other things. That's it for those announcements. I'll go into the, the mountain of what will be my life for the next two months. It is proposal season and there is money to be had out there and there's no reason to not go after it other than writing grants <laughs> and sitting at my computer all the time. But that's what we do. We got a proposal submitted this morning for Elkhorn. We had a presentation on biofiltration last year where this bioagriculture company had created a mycelial filter for acid mine water. So instead of a very expensive ion filter, you grow mushrooms on corn cobs that you buy for $6 a ton. So you can do this at scale. And the substrate that is created is negatively charged. So you run positively charged ions in contaminated water through that filter and they just suck right on the metals just glue right onto the substrate so the request here was to actually test this technology on wastewater seeps that are lower volume of water higher concentration of metals it's going to be way more applicable this technology will be way more applicable for that setting the added water we tested it on had it was way too much water with not enough metal so it turned out that the calcium held up, the calcium bonded to all the binding sites. There's too much calcium. Anyway, these are things to learn. That's why you do pilots. So hopefully we can get that technology deployed. And, you know, once they sort of work out the kinks, then you've got technology that can be taken to any acid mine seat on any mine site in Western Montana, grown fairly easily easily deployed. So that's what we're working on is kind of scaling that technology up. We have a major project at Pennington Bridge that will be getting designed this year. And we're just anticipating this RRG program comes once every biennium. So we got to get the request in now for the legislature to uh, approve next session in 2025. Uh, we did request money for this project last year and had a great conversation with the Bureau of Reclamation. They love the project. We just didn't have enough design yet for it. So we feel really good about getting that design money. Once we have the design, we'll reapply to the same grant. That's looking really good. I won't go into too much detail, but happy to talk about any of these projects if they're not ringing the bell. That's the, the S curve down by the Pennington Bridge. The river used to run that way under the upper bridge. Now it makes a hard S turn and it's eating away stream banks and if it eats away the bridge and the county road, that'd be really bad. So we're trying to avoid that. And we have three solutions to that problem. At just below Melrose, we're going to go to that same program, the same two programs I think will be a good combination to fund the double diversion down south of Melrose. Those are two diversions right next to each other that we have a design to consolidate them into one. Jim Olson's working on a, a, a fish project uh, with the channel that's going to get abandoned. Um, when you add fish to a project like this, it's easier to get money. It's amazing how difficult it is to get money for just irrigation projects that we're also working on. At Wise River and Jerry Creek, we have designs. We're ready to go. We're just sort of Picking away at where we think we can get funds for it. There is a program that the DNRC holds that we'll apply to. I have not worked with this program yet. Hopefully, that'll get some of that money in. Um, and then these, not quite sure yet. These aren't for sure, but we've been. In, I've been in touch with uh, an engineering firm that is looking at pulling out. This is a GIS exercise. Pull out every pine meadow in the big hole and show me how much, if you were to, how much potential storage there is in those meadows if they were fully saturated every spring. Fairly straightforward, but this is in addition to in combination with looking at hard storage options, which we already know and we already have. This is a more natural, lower tech way of storing water in a lot of places, less fun. And then I had a good talk with Jeanette Abdo who thought, we may be a good candidate for looking at that site that we discussed last November. 
for managed document for recharge and putting in a WIP proposal for them to do a feasibility of that location. So these last two are still kind of in discussion. That's all I got. That's going to be my life for the next couple of months. Don't have you. Anyone want to switch? <laughs> For any of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no questions, and we'll jump to the steering committee then. Yeah, we have a lot of Okay. Oh, sorry, Jay. <laughs> I do not know. Pedro asked to work remotely for the year of the So, the steering committee came up with guidelines under which we will be set uh, that possibility, and then we pass it around for consensus uh, on this group because the steering committee does things and, and then nothing moves until we get consent between the group. They consented to that. Right now, we're on a contract and an agreement, so everyone knows what they're going to do. It's not going to Pedro was down in Brazil, you know, he's been in the salad, don't let him spit out the bit. No, we're not going to know what that means. Anyway, we also did some work on costs, managing costs, and making sure that we report our projects to the, uh, the training agencies so that they have a smooth. And uh, did a lot of work there, and Steve did a lot of that work. So uh, we're trying to see, make more fluid and make more actions. We did pretty good. And also worked with Tim and Ben to sign out what they need when the table was drawn in the out of the system. So we did pretty good. Other than that, I don't believe there's anything else. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and now we'll move on to Canada. We are requesting funding to really ramp up our outreach efforts and get some display materials, and then we'll be partnering with the Youth Silver Bow um, Water Utility Division to have a big table and water filling station at the Montana Folk Festival this year. We did that last year, but they're looking like we're going to ramp it up this year and just have a lot more stuff for people to look at. So that'll be a fun event. And then we're also requesting funding for Al camera to make these meetings a little more visual for the folks on Zoom and a little, they can maybe run a little more smoothly on the papers in Brazil. Next thing we have, I don't know if Pedro wanted me to tell you about this year, but we'll be able to pay a farm qualification article coming out. And so we worked with this group called Pathless Communications. Basically, I don't know London, but they said they have works with me. We did some Zoom interviews with them. They wrote an article about the organization, and then they will be pitching it to some major media. Oh, two articles. And they'll be pitching it to some major media outlets and forums and yes. Oh, so all the all the big ones. So hopefully someone or all of them will, will bite on that. And then once it gets published, then we will have to pay. But it should be pretty exciting. And if it if if it's published, it will allow us to reach a much larger, more diverse audience than we normally reach. So we're excited about that. And so what I've been doing is just trying to make sure that all of our communications, our website, our social media online campaigns are all up to date so that if we start to get a lot more attention everything looks good so that's one way you can help if, if you'd like to uh, if you have time take a chance to just look at our website bhabc.org check out some of the pages and let me know if you see any typos anything that needs to, need to clarify um, any of the links that don't work I, i'm looking at it and updating all the time but there's a lot of pages there so Second set of eyes, Sherman, uh, Sherman Hurt. Yeah, so I've got the blue pages. And then next step. Okay, wildlife programs. So we have our carcass removal and composting program in Central Swing right now. And well, our carcass compost site is in the upper bay hole, but we will pick up carcasses throughout the watershed. 
That program runs March through May, and then our upper visual range writer program will be going on again this year, and it runs July through September. So what's new? We just hired a new driver for our Arcus program. His name is Justin Cunningham. Um, just to help our existing driver, John, out a little bit. He's very busy. And we have some new funding sources for the program. So these wildlife programs are kind of feast or famine with the funding. We're often trying to piece together funding year to year and uh, getting you know one year grants that will just slow us for that year and hoping that somebody else will come on top uh, the next year. So we're pretty excited to not be in that situation for a little while because we we've got our um, 2024 livestock lock board funding, which is $21,000 and it's secured. But then we'll also be some recipients of some large grants. We have the, uh, the American the Beautiful Challenge, which will be $140,000 through that over four years. And then the Regional Conservation Partnership Program grant we will get about 133000 over five years. So that's going to take a little stress on the new video and also just allow us to run those programs better and potentially expand them and make them better for the folks who transfer them. So if you have any suggestions or ways we can make the programs better, please let me know. Now or later. Yeah, we have the number for where it's rolling as it falls. I I don't know the current uh, numbers, but uh, yeah, so I'll just the upper big hole. We'll we'll pick up carcasses, and if the truck can get there, we need a little order to, to put them in the back of the truck. We'll come get them. Two yeah, awards. Were those amounts that you requested with those partners, or like, did you already have a budget for one? Yeah, so I had to put on there the for. So initially, we had to write letters stating what our match would be and what we were requesting. So I, I guess I haven't heard officially that those are the amounts we think we're going to get. Just that we will be funding. But I guess there's some question there. Does anybody have anything else where I'm like really bad? All right. All right. Well, these guys kind of summed up a lot of what's on my plate already, which is proposal season and project. They just mentioned that it's proposal season. It's always the muscle season in our line of work, but it's important to do and certainly so will be true for our restorations programs. This last month, I have been working on some project planning and proposals. One of them being that I wanted to highlight the Smith Safe Springs film project that we were undergoing right now. This whole film idea really came out of this DEQ319 grant that I have that helped pay for the implementation for the project. And a lot of what they like to see is this education and outreach task. And for this particular project, I said, so, hey, well, let's do a short little outreach video. And that'll kind of take care of what we need to deliver for DEQ. And since that, the, the project's actually taken some legs. We've had in around West Joint Venture, and Emily, who's here with us, help us out. And, uh, bring some additional funding to the project. And we're working with a really talented filmmaker who's really into to our line of work and, and what we're doing. And he's really excited about this particular project. So he's, he's really ambitious and we're going after some more funding, $50,000 to, to round out what he really wants to accomplish with this documentary. About the Smith Sage Springs restoration project, but it's not just that project. It's kind of using that project as a um, launching off point to show off all the collaborative conservation work that we do and, and the strong partnerships that we have here and 
the essence of the big old watershed community and the big old valley and, and everything that we do. So we're, we're going to kind of zoom out from the project and the 30,000 foot view and highlight um, everything that we do. So I've been working with the, the, the filmmaker on, on that grant. The other thing that's keeping me busy that I wanted to highlight for you guys tonight is our Elkhorn Ranch Revegetation and Fencing Project. What we're calling it. But, uh, we've been thankful and lucky enough to have some new landowners and, and some really conservation-minded folks move into the Wise River, the Old Sucker Ranch, and been working with these guys over the last year and a half to strategize for, uh, projects and, and sort of triage how we want to go about doing some conservation and restoration work on that land. And, uh, the the revegetation of their stream banks is uh, kind of always fizzled up to the top. And you know, the, the folks over there can be talking with the CCAA program, perhaps get involved with them, but you know, we're not going to wait for that. We're going to just go for it. The DEQ 319 grant to tackle this. And Wise River's just downstream here. And uh, it's hard to tell what, what we're talking about, but basically, I want to revegetate uh, over 6,000 linear feet of main stem big hole bank. With that, we're going to install just over a, a mile and a half of riparian fence. There is some bank reshaping and sloping that I want to do, and then I want to incorporate some exposure cloths. So, this, this is kind of the whole project overview here. This red line is where the riparian fence is likely going to go and tie into some existing fence infrastructure and go to the next one down. The yellow lines here are all the banks that are unvegetated. I walked these banks a couple weeks ago and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of revegetation. I think what we're going to do is we're going to do a lot of willow trenching and then staking and then come in and let the the passive restoration do its thing with the riparian fence, but I just highlighted these bluer areas where there's going to be some exposure plots. We'll, we'll do a six foot high fence and plant a ton of aspen and cottonwood in there. So developing this project, it's going to be it's going to be a big effort. But luckily, we have three years to do it, three full planting seasons. So this one's due early April, and I'm going to get that one submitted and, and cross our fingers. The next thing that I wanted to highlight was our Mount Haven Colbert removal and replacement project. The bids closed on that this last month. We had some really good qualified bidders get on the project, so that was good. I like to get those things out to bid early enough to get contractors to buy on before they get really, really busy. Um, but luckily, we had some competitive bids, and I ended up awarding the, the project to already another round of Dylan here. So they're excited about it. And uh, we're going to start to do that work in July after the uh, high water runs its course. Uh, it's interesting to get contracted with them and move them early for the next week. Other happenings I've been doing some project planning for our Eastern Pioneers work that we're doing with the BLM. Pedro touched on modification that we're doing with them. And this is the work that I just know that we're going to do this year without the modification. But it's in this Trapper Creek tributary. There's more than what we're going to do with just this conifer encroachment project, but this is on the immediate radar for me to get crews out and do work on. And it's the same exact specifications that we did on our ground zulch riparian conifer encroachment removal. It's going to be very similar, but we're just working in this Trapper Creek tributary. And what's really cool about this project is that over the last two years, we've already done the low tech, you know, BDA stream enhancements. And now we're going to come in after that and do the riparian copper encroachment. So it's going to be a nice complementary project to the, the low tech work. And just below this reach, JM's been already done the riparian copper encroachment on his land. So I think it's going to be a highlighting project, a good cross boundary project. So we're going to start cutting the week of April 8th. And I got the youth employment program to go some. Junipers out of that red herring area. Okay, and then lastly, this is exciting for me is I want to premiere our Upper Orient Creek outreach film for you guys. Uh, this is actually another DEQ outreach task that we have to do. Uh, this is the same filmmaker that's doing the Smith City Springs restoration project. Uh, this was all about three minutes long. The Smith City Springs project would have been similar to this, but we didn't get 
so stoked on that, but probably we'll see if I can turn this up here. Uh, while we figure this out, though, just before we play it, this is all the anaconda smelter impacts that we see here. This is that's what it is. We're getting feedback. To me, that it, we're muted for, and uh, that's a big issue. But I think one of the one of the things that we have to work with is we have so many ladder fields in, in the overgrowth and the mature growth, which is going to have to be a lot of work done in order to ensure that those stands stay intact. So that will require a lot of logging and, and prescribed fire and stuff like that. So. If that comes out on the pipe, I encourage you to download it and look at it so you understand it. It is not in your hand. Um, it's not a big deal. So we've got to look at it a lot harder. Just, just don't, don't, don't uh, say it's a bunch of crap. Because it, it might get very valuable to, to, to our resource. Is it open? It's open for comment right now, or we'll send it out there. We will share. Any other? I'm just curious. I'm just curious about the soils where you guys have done all that work. Is it is it clean? Is it is it toxic? Or what's wrong with the soils? They're clean. For the most part, because when the first smelter emissions really hit everything and the logging started 120 years ago, you know, 1880s and 1900s, that's when you had all the fine the clays and the silts still in the organic soil. And that's when that washed away, that washed a lot of the contamination with it. What we're left with that volcanic top air material is really sandy. So there's just not a lot of places for metals to hang out. So the pH of that soil are five and a half, six, perfectly normal for a pine forest. And that was one of the, yeah, 12 years ago when we started and we saw all these white spots on the map, we thought we were gonna have to be, you know, helicopter lining and disking in compost on the continental divide. And a little bit of research and some pilot studies later, we realized that it's just missing a lot of fertility. And the new thing that, you know, Ben didn't touch on, but we, we understand that we can juice the soil and give it nutrients and we can get grass to grow. Next step is based on our conversation from last month and the bio regenerative ag solution guys. We've been working with them and we'll be putting out a test plot to work on stimulating the soil biology. So all the nematodes and the critters under the soil, if we can give them the food that they need, they're the ones that are going to get the nutrients and bring them to the plants, ideally. So just we don't want to be in a cycle of continually juicing a degraded soil that doesn't get better by itself, right? That's a question. Oh yeah, and thanks Steve, I think you're on Zoom, but 
just note to everyone in the room, Steve, you know, in a meeting was like, oh, I was up in that Oregon Creek area. It's closed, you know, it's totally got white stuff coming off the mountains and it looks terrible. We should do something about it. So thanks, Steve, we did. Uh, but, you know, you guys see problems out there in the landscape. That's, that's how we, we jump on it and we bring partners together and we, we get some good work accomplished. So with that, I think we'll have a break. And then we'll come back to hear from our grilling team. I'll call you guys back. All right. We're very excited to have a large team. I'll let everybody introduce themselves, but this is our grilling program, folks. So we'll get an update we haven't had in quite a while. The grilling recovery program team, they're fresh off uh, a big meeting yesterday. Here we go. Okay. Ignore the title. We're not going to be talking about Centennial Valley. Ben can delete that from yesterday's slide. So we will be focusing on people. Um, I'm Caitlin. I'm, as some of you have already met me, I haven't met everyone here. I'm a right parent ecologist, and I took over Jarrett Haynes' position. So if you remember Jarrett, go back to Jarrett. Sometimes that makes remembering my name easier because the, there's another Caitlin in our group. But Cass is next to me, so I'll let Cass introduce yourself. Hi everyone, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Cass Fuller. I was the Arctic Grayling CCA Hydro and Habitat Technician for the past two years, but I recently transitioned, transitioned over to the Nature Conservancy, um, and that's kind of a bridge position since so Jim and he retired. I'll be taking over some of his responsibilities this year until he gets rehired out. So. Super excited to still be working with Nicole cool and being you know, part of all the great work that comes from them. I'm Water Keelan, you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sean Lewis, I know a lot of you in the room. This is your conservationist with the next guest out of Dillon, uh, covered in Beaverhead County, and I'll show you more about what we do here in a little bit. I'm Ryan Cracker. I am native fish biologist in Southwest Montana, so FWP Region 3. I work on primarily Arctic Greenland and West Slope Cutthroat Trout projects throughout the region. So. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So again, new members, we just basically went over that. Next slide. I think a lot of people get confused on what it means to be a right here ecologist. So I just thought I'd quickly put this here. Um, I'm administering the Big Bowl to Taylor Valley CCA programs. I do a lot with the landowner relations, enrollment, writing site plans, project development, rent carrying management, rent carrying assessments, do some permitting and Obviously, they work with my team. We basically just went over this, but again, this is our team looking at the big hole. And as you can see, Jim Olson works a lot in this program as well, but he will be doing a presentation later this year, so I didn't force him out here today. So, what is the CCAA? It stands for the Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. So, this is a voluntary program for landowners. And the goal of this program is to ensure a fluvial population of Arctic grayling in the upper reaches of the historic big old drainage. And we do this with four conservation measures in mind. Improving stream flows, improving and enhancing and maintaining riparian habitat, reducing entrainment, and reducing barriers to fish migration. Currently, we have 30 landowners enrolled with 167,000 acres in total. About five and a half of those are DNRC leased land. All right, so I'm going to talk about conservation measure one, which is improved stream flows in the upper Big Hole. We have set flow targets that we need to meet in the spring and the summer. In 2023, we met those targets 81% of the year. That's between April 1st and October 31st, and that's through the entire reaches of the CCAA. We also had 50.2 CFS in landowner stream flow contributions this summer. We do irrigation compliance and monitoring twice a year to make sure that the 
head gates and infrastructure are functioning properly or, and that their measuring devices are set and that they're meeting their site plans. We have 29 landowners right now that we're monitoring and over 100 measuring devices. We also have those four DNRC real time stream, real time stream gauge stations, two USGS gauges, and 18 true track sites. This is a map of all the things that we monitor throughout the CCAA. That includes my stream gauge sites and um, all the blooms uh, that are included in enrolled properties. This is just another map of all of my stream gauge monitoring sites. And then the little orange Cheerio things are um, the true tracks, which are those data loggers that Pedro and I've been abused in Wise River. And those are either on tributaries of the Big Old River or in larger or larger diversions. Uh, just an update for 2024. We were, we're working towards including all stream gate, all streams that are um, either grayling spawning habitat or refuge tributaries. And so this summer, I'm going to be putting in true tracks in Pitler, Clinton, Fish Trap, and Warm Springs, in addition to my plethora of true tracks that I have right now. So there's a lot going on in this graph, but I just wanted to show you guys how everything happens at the wisdom gauge through time. So 2006 up to 2023, light green is percent peak snowpack. The bar, the blue is year to date precipitation. The green, this right here, is days below 20 CFS at Wisdom Bridge. This blue line is days above 73 degrees Fahrenheit at that Wisdom gauge. And then the yellow is the number of river closure days. One thing to note is that the trend line for degrees above 73 is actually decreasing over time, which is super interesting. And I mean, the glaring thing is 2021 is horrible. I to talk a little bit about landowner contributions in the CCAA because I, we feel like it's one of the most important things in the summer to keeping those free flow targets being met and keeping the wetted perimeter. This is another schematic of those contributions through time. So starting in 2006 and going up to 2023, as you can see, there's a lot of water put back in the river by private landowners. Our regions each have individual targets between the spring and the summer. So for example, at, at Wisdom, which is in section C, the spring flow target is 160 CFS. And then in the springtime, or so that, and then in the summertime, it's 60 CFS. Because of how the winter is going, we got together and we kind of put together a drought plan just in case things don't improve or we don't get precipitation in the spring and going into the summer. So it's going to be implemented May 1st if we decide that some of these criteria are met. But what it would mean is that A, B, and C reaches would be combined into one reach target flow and it would be 60 CFS starting in this on by May 1st instead of that 160. And the criteria for meeting that would be percent speed for the water year. And I want to, and we'll evaluate what the percentage is for every elevation of snowpack. Also, eight, less than 8% precipitation for the water year. We'll also look at higher than average air temperatures before May 1st. And then when the peak spring runoff is starting, if it starts earlier than May 1st, because as we all know, the average is about June 1st for that peak flows. And then also one of the criteria is climate forecast for May and June, which would include less than average precipitation. So this past year in 2023, we completed seven projects to improve stream flow across six properties, which includes head gates, blooms, and a stock tank repair. And as you can see, this was done across a lot of streams in our drainage. So Big Lake Creek, Rock Creek, Owl Creek, Fish Trap, East Fish Trap, East Fish Trap, and Minor. For 2024, we have four projects planned. 
another head gate, um, a flume, and two dish efficiency projects. Looking at our next conservation me measure, riparian habitat. So currently with our site plans, there are grazing plans as well developed in them. So our grazing strategies are working and projects are as well. And of course, there's always more work to be done. To highlight the last year, we did a restoration on the Big Bull River with a high flow channel activation. These two photos, the top is before and the bottom is after. Not taken from the exact same viewpoint, but it, this bank was armored with a lot of vegetation. And DNRC helped develop a lecture app to make data collection more efficient in the field. So we assess our streams using the NRCS rapid riparian assessment method. And there are 10 categories in this assessment, but they basically get down to two things, which is stream morphology and vegetation. So is the stream incising? Is it becoming too wide vegetation wise? Is there low cover or deep? Breeding species like willows and sedges, which provide bank stability, what is the browse, and so on. So, this assessment is out of 100, and they are rated into three categories a 0 to 49 score is not sustainable, 50 to 79 is at risk, and 80 to 100 is sustainable. Currently in the big pool in our program, the average is 78.08 across 259 miles. So that average puts us just into at risk. And comparing this to when the program started, which is 69.6, you can see there's been a lot of growth. This past year, Cass and I completed 65.12 miles of assessments. A lot of walking, a lot of walking. <laughs> And Cass is a impressive trooper. She does it in Chacos. So, <laughs> okay. So this graph is looking at initial miles versus current. So miles are our y-axis, and these different ratings are on our y. And what we can see now is there are a lot more sustainable miles than there was in the beginning. And there's a little bit at risk and a little less non-sustainable damage. But I think that graph is a lot quicker to digest and doesn't tell the whole story because a lot of these properties, some have been in since the beginning, some are newer. So hopefully this graph is easy to understand, but I wanted to look at how these scores have changed over time. And so the, this x-axis represents the different assessment rounds that have occurred. So every three to five years, we reassess reaches and Number one represents their initial initial assessment. And so then number two would be three to five years later, three would then be six to ten, and four would be nine to twelve years later from that initial. On our Y, we have proportion of total miles. So within each assessment, this sums up to 100 percent That sums up to 100 percent And what we can see is in this initial assessment round, most streams were rated at risk. And then over time, these at-risk reaches have become sustainable, and our non-sustainable reaches have become at-risk. And so we've done a lot of methods over the years to improve these riparian habitats. And one of the biggest ones we've been working on recently is stock water systems. And Sean will be talking about it a little more right after this, but I thought I'd quickly just relate how this relates to riparian habitat, which is essentially stock water systems give us a water source in upland pastures. And in riparian pastures, we can move it away from the stream itself and move the cattle away from directly drinking out of the river, which can reduce bank trampling. And we can get less grazing on our deep rooted species. But I don't want to go too much into that because Sean really talked about stock water systems. 
Thank you. I think she did almost all of the closing. Oh, I lied. Apologies. I don't know the order of my own slides. So this past year, we completed 22 projects across six properties. We did a river restoration and high load conservation I mentioned earlier. And we have worked on 22 stock water facilities from spring and wells. Next slide. Now it's here. Sorry. That's, that's the, so on the previous slide, she said something about 22 different stock water projects, right? And that's where our outfit comes into play is we provide some of the money, some of the technical expertise for not only stock water stuff, but a bunch of other stuff we'll get into in a second. So I'm with Natural Resources Conservation Service right there, that one. So we've been involved in the CCAA since the early 2000s. We were signatory on it on in 2006 when like the five major outfits got together and signed it and um, we started proposing it, uh, applications to producers, that kind of thing. We started working on somewhat specific grayling stuff in the big hole in the late 90s as far as some diversions with maybe some fish ladders and uh, design work on that. Um, NRCS's role has been some technical expertise, so design and engineer for structures, including diversions, fish ladders, stock water systems. We've done a few, this was a long time ago, some riparian restoration, a little bit of riparian restoration work up there too. But let's see. So a few years ago, I just got to say this, that we switched a way we do business into what they're calling Montana Focus Conservation, which basically allows our field office personnel to, you know, solicit input from local entities, all the ag producers, to try to figure out what projects are the most important at that time in that county. So we have a meeting every May, usually every year, where we try to get some information along with all of these other meetings that we go to, we should try to figure out exactly what the problems are that we could, our outfit can help with. And through that, we develop a proposal, is what I call it, because that's what the rest of the world calls it, but in RCS, we call it targeted, targeted implementation plans. So it's basically a proposal saying, hey, we want to work on this type of project in this landscape and have these willing landowners ready to pounce and, and do good work, right? So we wrote a Wrote a proposal, started, got together with Jim Payne, <laughs> Jared Payne, Matt Yeager, I think, started all in about 2019 to try to put together and we finally got our first TIP funded in 2022, asking for at that time $241,000 from our NRCS pot of money and the other outfits, the NRC was part of it too. You know, those some of the numbers on the page here. Yeah. Whether you know it or not. Anyway, and partners said they could contribute about 100K to that project. Go ahead. So we got that one funded, and it was reaches A and B, so down to Jackson for the Minor Creeks Bridge, or Minor Lake, Minor Bridge Road Bridge project. Anyway, and we had several landowners that were ready and willing to work in that area, and then it became pretty popular really quickly that so we did another proposal for the next reach down to Wisdom River Bridge, which is that second one. We asked for 367 NRCS dollars or thousand NRCS dollars with 150k partner match. The interesting thing is it says 17 projects on the upper and the wisdom reach. So very similar projects, but look at the dollar figure difference between those two years. That was kind of an interesting thing. It's been quite double, right? But it was at least one and a half plus times the amount of dollars to do the same projects just one year apart with, you know, the blooming cost of everything. Mm -hmm. um, those numbers have fluctuated a little bit. The partner contribution, I think, has grown a lot. We need to sit down one of these days soon and put together our actual dollar numbers, but I think the partner contribution is, is probably equal to NRCS dollars at this point, honestly. But so 17 stock water projects that includes like a well pipeline tank would be one project or a couple tanks per project. 
And then we're doing some stream development, pipeline, several tanks on the different projects. So I mean, that's a total of 34 different projects scattered out over, oh, 12 to 14 different landowners trying to help pull cattle away from the riparian area with one thing, you know, to keep, get them fresh water outside of the creeks. But the other thing is sometimes we're able to put some water developments up in a pasture that might not have water later in the year. So people are able to use that country a little bit different timing than they would previously. So we're changing the season of use on the riparian stuff. But another, another thing that's hard to quantify is we're also helping put some water in some pastures that are fed with soft water diversion ditches. So we're maybe able to turn off or lower the flow through those diversion ditches for stock water, which in the background will keep water in the tributary and down the remains down so that one's hard to quantify because it's really hard to measure those those inputs but the other trees. So we're also helping out with the riparian assessment models when we can. We've been a little bit weird on staff that the last two years, but MRCS is one of our agreement agreed to items in the MOU is that we'll help with that. So we're helping when we can there. The next thing is our outfit has agreed to pay for a half of a full-time employee, so like 50% of the salary of, of one of the personnel that helps out with the CCA team. So we're not only putting money on the ground, we're paying for people to do good work and, and work on top of too. So I tried to throw this in there. The, the proposals that got funded up here on the top, I did a really quick snippet that's actually 10 to 12 pages, something like that. So if you want to see any more information on it, just Google Montana NRCS and it, it'll come up with our web page and scroll down just a tiny bit and you can click on what's available, available in my county. Go to Beaverhead County and it'll show those with the maps and a little bit more information on exactly what's available in those tips. One more. I got away with only doing two slides. So the green is kind of hard to see, but reaches A and B are what's in the green map. And then this is the wisdom reach, so reach C is, is where we're working right now. We are hopefully going to extend the wisdom reach downstream. We're trying to figure out how far downstream right now we can go. Because there are a few more landowners that are that need some top water developments, and, and this is an easy way to help fund them right now, right? So we're trying to go a little bit farther down. We don't know how far yet, but there's like bridge is a Jerry Creek. Where do we stop at the end? So we, we're going to move ahead and we've got more ideas since then. So another thing we've been talking about, when did we have our first meeting? It was or it was your ever was three years ago? Something like that. It's, it's been a yeah. while. Pre-COVID. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've lost all time. Yeah. Yeah. So Pedro came to us a long time ago. I'll just say that. Um, with some projects in the Wise River area, you know, the thing we're dealing with the irrigation on the bench right about Wise River to try to figure out how to write a proposal to, for NRCS to put some money into that and some, and some engineering time into that um, through, through the TIF process that I just talked about. We talked again a few more times, not uh, what about a month ago, the last time. So. That one's in the works. They've done, done a ton of work on it already. So we're trying to figure out how to fit that into our little black box of NRCS and then put a little more gray that you were talking about earlier. So um, there's that one. And that's kind of all we've got going on right now. I think it's May 9th. We're having a local work group meeting. So the meeting's called there in Dillon. I think we're going to have it at the BNRC building. And that's I get this feel of we have this meeting and lots of people come together and we have good ideas and da 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 da. But it's basically quite simply the squeaky wheel gets the grease in some cases. So that's the meeting to show up to if you want to do the squeaky wheel. That's what puts stuff on our long range plan as far as what funding and good needs there are in this town. So throw that out there. On the average, how much do those stuff that takes to come to the install? Ballpark for one system for let's say 200 head, it would be watering at a time in short period of time, but about 10 grand, no more than 20 grand, 10 to 20. 
because you got a 100 to 200 foot well, which is now 100 bucks a foot, right? So, and then a couple tanks, and yeah, 10 to 20 for something that's I know on the floor of the of the big old down. We got a proposal from another place the other day that they're looking at seven different systems that are stretched out quite a bit. So they got some more storage needs and some more pipeline, and that one's about 500,000 bucks is what they approach us with. And I was like, oh, that's a whole proposal all in itself. So they're getting more expensive, just like everything else, unfortunately. I'm going to skip off to the next. You can take questions, more questions at the end, I guess. So looking ahead in 2024, we have 18 projects planned. Restoration on the Governor Creek and 17 stock water systems, including the different steps involved, like drilling the well and the access system itself. What is the Governor Creek restoration? It's soft bank restoration. So mature willows, willow staking, and sloping the banks. So pretty simple restoration. Yeah, and on five outside banks. So I stopped it before it gets too bad. Yeah. Looking at our third conservation measure, fish passage. I'm not going to go too much into detail on this one, but I thought I'd just kind of highlight how much has been done throughout the CCA program. So when we talk about these tiers, these are our tiers of habitat, like how important the habitat is across the big hole. And what I'm really just gonna focus on is tier one is our forest spawning and refugia. And we have opened it up and fish now, Great Lake now have access to 98% of this habitat. And before the CCA program, it was only 87. So, and with these next two tiers, you can also see a lot more habitat has been opened up to fish passage. And historically, a lot of what we've done for this is fish ladders, fixing bridges, culverts, and in the Centennial Valley, we just uh, set pool projects in kind of a new way we've never done before. And so if that works out well, it might be a new technique we bring into the big pool. So in 2023, we still did two projects for fish passage. We did a bridge and we reset this fish ladder. And you can see it's not really working. So this head gate and fish ladder were reset. And for 2024, we currently just have one project planned, which is another bridge. Our last conservation measure, entrainment. So according to the site plans, we survey ditches every five years. And problematic ditches, meaning the ones we are catching grayling in, we go check them annually. And this last year, we completed a project to try and eliminate basically our last threat of treatment we were having in the big hole. So it's not a big concern in the big hole anymore. It's been addressed, including in the past, we've installed fish creek across Rock Creek and LaMarche Creek. So this next year, we do not have any entrainment projects planned. It just kind of shows we fixed a lot of problems that were there. Okay, we can open up to questions about this now. Anything I said, or Caitlin, or Sean, and then Ryan is going to be presenting or more fish. Yeah, I don't know who's <laughs> I sadly do not have any photos of Tim Gander holding a railing. Um, if you know who that is, almost every single photo we have of railing is from a fish tank named Tim holding them. So yesterday at our big railing meeting, almost every single presentation had like five photos of Tim. And Tim's no longer with us. It was fine. Okay, well, no one has anything for me. Let's run. Yes. Yeah. 
So, so while these guys are doing all these good projects to benefit the Great Lakes and the Big Bowl, kind of the one that goes out and makes sure there's still fish there. I also do the entrainment surveys, so we shock, like Caitlin just talked about it. We shock ditches every year, and as she mentioned, really there's been one consistent source of grayling entrainment in the upper river, and there's Tim Gander holding a fish. So yeah, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how we monitor fish grayling in the big hole, give you some of the results. I'll talk a little bit about our version of a beaver dam working group and and then one additional slide and you know if you guys have any questions feel free to ask i do work on a lot of westland cutthroat trout projects too and all the other grayling and cutthroat populations in this region so if you have any questions you can ask them at the end this map shows the upper big hole river you know wisdom's kind of right around here um the stars indicate like our primary grayling spotting tributaries so most of them are in the upper river by wisdom uh there's a couple of important tributaries down kind of in the lower end of the ccaa and that that stars on deep creek there and then we also do monitor fish trap creek which i'll, I'll talk about in a second this is this is that's fish trap, that's deep creek actually, and that's how we that's how we catch fish. So about a starting in, we switch to a genetic form of monitoring grayling. Basically, you know, you hear when when Jim Olson comes and presents results on the brown trout estimates, he's going out and he's doing a, a standard mark recapture where he marks fish, goes back a week later, recaptures them. He can estimate how many fish there are per mile. That's what they used to do, but because grayling are so spread out and they are up in tributaries, they move around a lot, the, the estimates were kind of all over the place. So what we did starting in 2006 was we go out every fall into these known spawning areas and we try to catch as many of these young of year grayling or age zero fish as we can. We take a genetic clip and that can determine the a genetic estimate of how many parents produce that cohort of fish. So I just wanted to show you you know, this is a grayling that we, we caught in late September that hatched probably in mid May. So grayling grow really fast. You know, they hatch as about less than an inch long. And in four months, they're about four and a half to five and a half inches long. So compared with a trout's growth, it's, it's much faster. And then we also do occasionally catch these one-year-old fish. So these fish have been alive for about a year and four months, and they're about 10 inches. So, any questions? So, what we do, what this estimate, like I just said, number of effective breeders that gave rise to a single cohort, and a cohort is a year class. I want to point out that. The numbers here, the estimate of effective breeders is actually lower than the total number of fish that are spawning. And there's a number of reasons for that, but in salmonids, which are grayling, trout, salmon, it's typically pretty low. It's usually about 0.13 to 0.15 of the total population. In the Centennial Valley, where we do, we actually do a mark recapture estimate and we get an estimate of effective breeders, the long-term average is about 0.19. So I'll I'll talk about that in a second, but I guess what I'll point out is, you know, the CCAA program started in 2006 and 
for the first few years, we were really hovering around this kind of, it was like a consistently low number of rail. And then beginning in 2012, and you know, we had a big water year in 2011, um, the population kind of bumped up and it's gone down and gone up and gone, you know, it, it's fluctuated more and that's really good. And I'll talk about that too in a second, why that's really beneficial, especially when we're trying to maintain like genetic diversity. But yeah, last year we did have a slight bump. 2022 was kind of the lowest number we've had in a little while, but you know, getting a low number occasionally is okay as long as the population is getting less. What you don't want is that, that steady low number. So yeah, and that's and I just wanted to show you real quick what I just said. This is the Centennial Valley. Um, this mark recapture column is our actual population estimate that we get, and this is our effective breeders. And if you can see down here, the long-term average for the ratio is about 0.1 nine. So, you know, even when you have an estimate of, you know, in the less than 100, you're your population is still can be pretty high. So we get this question a lot. People see, oh, you guys got 167 last year. So there's that means there's 167 gray length in the big hole. And actually, that's not true, as you just learned. So if I had to estimate how many grayling were actually out there last year using that ratio based on this number, I would guess that this is our 95% confidence interval, somewhere between 736 and a little over a thousand fish. And another, uh, just an easier way to look at things and kind of see how they compare these are some of our sites that we actually sample fish. And the blue column is how many fish we've gotten in that section last year. And then I put a couple of long-term averages. So, you know, a 2016 to 2023 average, that's orange, and then an older average, and that's gray. And what you can see here is that last year we had a couple sites, three sites that were above long-term averages, a lot of sites that were pretty much the same, one site that was down. So we see this a lot. Some years a trip produces a lot of gray length, some years it doesn't, but we do have some really consistent producers of gray length. And I mentioned this too, you know, one of the really big concerns when you have a population that may not be doing as well is you want to maintain the genetic diversity. There's two metrics we use, allelic richness, heterozygosity. It's just basically telling you how diverse the gene pool is. You know, we all know what inbreeding is. That's what happens when you have a really low number of fish or any other animal and they're breeding together and you start to lose important genes that help with adaptation and things like that. And so one of our goals is to maintain genetic diversity over time. And you can see that over time, since the 1990s in the Big Hole River, it's been actually pretty consistent. And that's good. That's, that's a sign that this population is in good shape for persistence in the future. So the question was, what, what would you do to add in genetic diversity? Luckily, we haven't had to do that in the big hole. We do see this a lot with our small, isolated West Slope cutthroat population. So, you know, cutthroat used to be one big population. Like they lived in the big hole, they lived in all the tributaries, but with non-native fish and other things happening, they're pretty much isolated in these little pockets, and these fish become isolated from each other, and they all kind of start to decline in diversity. But 
the cool thing is, like for this cutthroat example, that within the big hole, all the historic genetic diversity is still exists. It's just isolated in these little pockets. So when we mix fish together, we can build that population back up. And actually, French Creek, which hopefully you guys have heard about Jim Olson Sajid there, he has created a big hole brood of cutthroat trout mixing all the little populations to form this really genetically diverse population that kind of represents the historic, what it historically was. Uh, but for some of our trailing populations, we do, we can mix fish around from other areas and, and do it. But I just wanted to show you this. This is Centennial Valley. This is an actual population estimates. You can see we're kind of at that level I told you about. It's been low for a long time, and there's an issue there that we've identified and we're trying to get permission to fix it. But at the same time, while, these, while our numbers have been really low, you can see that the genetic diversity is declining. And actually, we've lost quite a bit of alleles in the population. So it's pretty concerning, and we might actually have to do what we were just talking about there. So, two more seconds. So, Caitlin Deloy talked about the four conservation measures of the Big Hole CCA, and then one of them was eliminating barriers to fish migration. And the focus in the CCA for that is um, diversion structures. You know, there were diversion structures blocking fish migrations, and as she pointed out, they alleviated a lot of those through fish ladders and other things, culvert removals. But what we're seeing now is, you know, we're getting a lot of beaver dams. And I know beaver dams are good, not saying they're bad, but this is a beaver dam on the lower end of Fish Trap Creek, about a couple hundred yards up from the mouth. And what did you do? And so when I started, and I don't know if you can see this graph, sorry, I'm moving something here. I started in 2020 and we were going out doing our fall sampling. We didn't sample Fish Trap Creek because they weren't catching grayling there anymore. We were trying to catch grayling. And I, in 2021, I said, they used to catch a lot of grayling in there. Let's go sample Fish Trap Creek. And we got no fish. And this beaver dam was at the lower end. So the next spring we went out and we notched a hole in it. Yeah. So we put a hole in the dam. And if you can see that graph for the next two years, we started catching more and more grid. So this is something that we're gonna keep doing. And I'll I'll just run through a couple more examples and go to the next one. So Steel Creek up by Wisdom is a really important spawning tributary for Gray Lake. The long-term average we get about 28 per year, and it can range as high as 60 per year. But in, in 2022, so this is Steel Creek here, and these are beaver dams, the red dots. We got six, oh, go to the next slide. We got six fish and they were all in the lower 400 yards of stream. And this, this site is like three miles long. So we went out the next spring and notched seven dams. And then that year, yeah, next one. Next year we got 25 grayling and they were kind of spread all throughout. So yeah, just something that we're gonna keep doing. I think I might have a couple more on that, but Kind of skip through Plimpton Creek, another important one. It does fluctuate. Um, we got a low number here, not some dams. Number went up. This one can range really high, but I do think that from what I've heard, these low numbers here were probably due to beaver dams in that part of the uh, year. We did some notching on Lamarsh Creek too, which isn't as important of a tributary for spawning, but it's 
really cold and really wet to move in there in the summer when the main river gets hot. And then a couple of streams that had big beaver dams. We went out to survey last year, and because we had a lot of water, the dams were eliminated and fish could access the stream. So, and I'm just going to show here that I think. In 2022, on these six streams, we estimated there was about 2.6 miles of accessible habitat and through notching and basically now.